Hi, Nutrition 111 students. Let's take a look at chapter 10. Here we go. And in chapter 10, we're talking about body defenses. The beginning of the chapter describes the complexities in a fascinating way, of course, of the immune system. I'm gonna leave that reading up to you because we are gonna focus on the nutrients that support that immune system and the non-nutrients as well. So this immune system is actually a collection of diverse tissues, including our skin, our intestinal cells, uh, barriers to those um, pathogens from entering the body, our white blood cells and our lymphoid tissue, the attack um, against those pathogens that and harmful cells that come inside of our body proper. And these work together to prevent infection, to break down dying cells, and also to re remove abnormal cells. So important for stopping cancers before they start. We are going to look at five of the nutrients that are important for immunity. But I want you to keep in mind as you we look at these next two charts that because of the uh, complexity of the immune system, many nutrients are involved. And besides nutrition, uh, certainly things like physical activity and adequate sleep and managing stress are important for immunity as well. We're going to talk about vitamin A because it's hugely important for the health of epithelial cells. We see here that vitamin B6 and vitamin B12 12 become involved as well in immunity. We'll talk about vitamin C. It's an antioxidant, and so it protects immune cells and, and other cells. We're not going to talk about vitamin D. That will come into play when we discuss um, bone health. But I will tell you, there's some fascinating research on vitamin D and its correlation with susceptibility to things like flu and um, even COVID-19, being that it appears lower levels increase risk. We also see that those with higher levels of vitamin D in the blood have lower risk for not only autoimmune diseases, but some cancers as well. So a lot of interesting stuff. We're gonna talk about vitamin E. It is also an antioxidant. Folate is important for the health of epithelial and, and blood cells. We will discuss zinc in this chapter. And you can see here that it supports the cell's ability to use oxidation reactions to kill pathogens. We'll talk about iron and copper later, but they're involved in immunity. And we will discuss selenium. It also protects immune cells from oxidative damage. Before we get going with these nutrients, I did want to talk about antioxidants and oxidative stress. So oxidative stress is linked to many chronic diseases and you can see them here, okay? Both chronic inflammation and oxidative stress seem to be some of the root causes for many of the diseases that plague us and some of our leading killers. You see cardiovascular disease, you see cancers, you see diabetes. Antioxidants protect the body from damage by free rad radicals. That damage is called oxidative stress or oxidative damage. So free radicals actually have an unpaired electron and they become very um, damaging because they are kind of searching out somewhere to grab that electron. So they damage structures such as DNA within cells and antioxidants defend against that attack. And you can see that here. Dietary guidelines recommend that we get these antioxidants from food, and I would recommend the same. 
a plant-based diet full of a lot of colorful fruits and vegetables, as well as whole grains and nuts and seeds is most likely to give you the vitamins, minerals, and phytochemicals that defend the body. All right, so let's start with vitamin A. There are two major forms of vitamin A, preformed and um, provitamin A or beta carotene or the carotenoids um, more broadly. So let's talk about vitamin A first. This is what we call preformed vitamin A. Its richest sources are in liver and um, the oils in fish, not fish oil supplements, by the way, but the oils in fish, as well as those other animal foods that you see listed. Interestingly, vitamin A was mentioned as one of the nutrients where the margin of safety is the most narrow and also the one of the nutrients where we've seen toxicity from overconsumption of high sources of preformed vitamin A. Now the carotenoids can be converted to vitamin A. Beta carotene is the major one. Beta carotene is a bright, bright orange. So we see that the foods that are richest in beta carotene are either bright orange or dark musky green. Combining that chlorophyll with the beta carotene gives that dark green. So the sources are over here and note that it's an extremely effective antioxidant. So vitamin A is important for the health of the epithelial cells and these cells line internal and external surfaces. So the eyes, skin, lungs, intestines, stomach, vagina, urinary tract, bladder, and these cells form an important barrier to infection. Retinoic acid is required for immature cells to develop properly into mature functional cells. And vitamin A also supports the T lymphocytes. One of the earliest signs of vitamin A deficiency is night blindness. Night blindness is when your vision is worse in low light conditions. And in some cases, people can't see much at all. Now, vitamin A deficiency is not the only cause for um, poor night vision, but it's an early sign of vitamin A deficiency nonetheless, and that should be ruled out as a cause. Vitamin A is important as one of the pigments in the visual process, and when there isn't enough available to be reconverted to vitamin, um, to that pigment after it's bleached out, then we see this night blindness as a symptom. We also know that one of the leading causes of visual problems in older people, which is macular degeneration, is less likely when the diet is higher in carotenoids. So carotenoids are listed here, um, lutein and xanthin, they tend to be yellow in color and green, of course, when mixed with um, the chlorophyll that we find in leafy green vegetables. Vitamin A is important in growth in even mild vitamin A deficiency. And that's not uncommon with children because of these sources of beta carotene being those fruits and vegetables. In mild conditions, we can see an impact on growth, whereas growth potential is not reached. You see here this term differentiation and maturation of cells. This is extremely important. Vitamin A is important for um, the correct maturation of cells, for those cells to form the tissues and organs they are meant to do or to, to create. And you're going to see in just a minute that how that um, correlates to some of the symptoms of vitamin A deficiency. We know that um, carotenoids may limit oxidation of LDLs and therefore are important for cardiovascular disease prevention as well. There's probably not a downside to eating plenty of healthy 
fruits and vegetables by any means. Consuming five servings a day at the minimum should be a good guideline. Vitamin A is also important for cancer prevention. And again, primarily that pro-vitamin A found in carotenoids, lower risk of skin, lung, bladder, and breast cancer. We have to be more careful with uh, supplements because toxicity of vitamin A is also a consideration. All right, so let's talk about deficiency and toxicity. Three main problems for deficiency. We talked about vision. Um, we are discussing the immune system for sure, and also stunted growth. In severe cases of vitamin A deficiency, this can lead to death. And please note that globally, one third of children suffer from vitamin A deficiency, primarily from very inadequate diets and hundreds of thousands become blind each year from a vitamin A deficiency. This condition in the eye is called xerophthalmia. We see xerophthalmia here. When vitamin A is not adequate in order for proper maturation of the cells, it leads to a keratin surface rather than a nice moist uh, mucus secreting surface in some cases. And therefore in the eye, the impact of this is a permanent blindness called xerophthalmia. In the skin, we see that the skin scales cells make too much keratin. And keratin is a very hard protein of our hair and our nails. And hyperkeratosis looks like goosebumps, but they don't go away with warming. We need to get enough vitamin A and make sure that our children get enough vitamin A for sure. The preformed, as we've spoken about already, can be found in these animal source foods and carotenoids with the, which the body changes into active vitamin A is typically found in those dark green and yellow orange vegetables and fruit. One of the things that's interesting about these pigments is that cooking actually increases absorption. When we talk about lycopene and its health effects, it often comes hand in hand with the advice to make sure that you cook tomato products several times a week to, for better absorption. So here are some sources of vitamin A and carotenoids. So keep in mind, vitamin A from the animal foods, carotenoids are the pre-vitamin A or pro-vitamin A from the brightly colored plant foods. Now, I mentioned several times that vitamin A has a UL that's well above the recommendation, but the margin of safety is a little closer than other nutrients. And in fact, this is one of the rare instances where there have been toxicity cases from an actual food. It's not a common food in these parts, but four ounces of polar bear liver can deliver a toxic dose. Intakes above the UL for vitamin A, and this is one that I typically check because of the more narrow margin of safety, can increase liver toxicity, risk of hip fracture, um, be problematic and disastrous in a pregnancy leading to birth defects as well as spontaneous abortions. So very important that pregnant women are not taking supplements of vitamin A. Too much from carotenoids has a different impact. Uh, beta carotene is stored in the fat right underneath the skin. So if you eat loads of foods that are packed with beta carotene or take pills, by the way, uh, you can start to turn a little tinge of orange. That's something I've never seen that degree of yellow orange, but you typically do see it in the hands, palms of the hands and the soles of the feet. 
it's not dangerous because the body has a kind of limit to how much beta carotene it pulls up and turns into the active vitamin A. But to reverse that color, you would just cut back on those foods. I eat carrots every day with my lunch. And sometimes I do notice a little tinge, nothing that to that degree for sure. Okay, moving on to vitamin C or ascorbic acid. Very important for collagen synthesis. So it's found in connective tissue and bones, teeth, tendons, blood vessels. And because it's important in collagen synthesis, it's very important for healing, for healing wounds, for instance. It is vital in the formation of other compounds, as you can see here. And it is also an antioxidant. So we talked about beta carotene and vitamin C so far as being an antioxidant, protecting our bodies from that oxidative damage. It's important for the strength of our immune system, though it doesn't prevent colds. Vitamin C supplements seem to have a bit of a his, um, antihistamine effect and they decrease the symptoms of a cold. But as far as preventing colds, nah, might shorten the duration by part of a day. So a very small impact. May decrease the formation of carcinogen nitrosamines in the stomach and something that we'll talk about because many women especially are prone to iron deficiency, it has a big impact on the absorption of iron. Here we see the effect early on of the reduced collagen synthesis. So bleeding gums and little bits of bruising where there is pressure applied to the skin would indicate um, a vitamin C deficiency. Vitamin C deficiency, if not reverse, can be deadly and was back in the day before a cure or prevention of citrus fruit fruits was discovered. There you see the pinpoint hemorrhages of the skin, which are an early symptom of scurvy. It's not tough to get the RDA for vitamin C, even the extra 35 milligrams that smokers need because one glass of orange juice will do it. Individuals who typically have low levels of, um, low intake levels of vitamin C, don't eat much in the way of fruits of vet or vegetables at all. So you can see here, citrus fruit, fruits are a source, but so are many other fruits and vegetables. If you're eating fruits and vegetables, you're probably meeting your vitamin C recommendations. Now, as far as avoiding too much, the UL is set at 2000 milligrams, can't get there with food, but you could get there with supplements. So you have to be careful about supplements. One of the, the problems with too much vitamin C um, centers around digestion. So inflammation, diarrhea, GI distress. But I also want to mention, and it's not on this slide, that there is concern about kidney stones, especially for men, since men are more prone to kidney stones. So be careful about taking vitamin C supplements if you're a man, because it may increase your risk of kidney stones. Here are the sources. So let's flip back for just a minute. We're talking 75 or 90 milligrams. And if we look at the amounts in a cup of orange juice, only one cup, which is a small serving these days, that more than meets your recommendation. On to vitamin E. And by the way, vitamin E is another antioxidant with a very kind of focused impact. Um, it's important for muscles and nerves and uh, in the immune system as well. You can see here, these are some good sources of vitamin E. We think of healthy plant oils, wheat germ, um, nuts and seeds. So this fat soluble vitamin is found in adipose tissue, as many are, and the cell membrane. Okay, we know that these membrane lipids are polyunsaturated, and we also know that they are susceptible to oxidative attack. So vitamin E donates electrons or hydrogens to free radicals to make the cell more stable. 
it's very important in certain areas exposed to high levels of oxygen, and that would be the red blood cells and the lungs. Deficiency is rare because of all of the oil containing food that we consume, but we are concerned about preterm infants because vitamin E is transferred late in pregnancy to the infant. And that oxidative damage with a deficiency of vitamin E causes red blood cells to break and spill their contents. Smoking also destroys vitamin E in the lungs. And another place where we see a deficiency is in fat malabsorption disorders. We did talk about this already. So something like cystic fibrosis, for instance, getting enough, we find it in plant oils for sure. Um, we find it in nuts and seeds, uh, fortified cereals as well. And here are some food sources. Now, too much vitamin C, believe it or not, can be a problem. There is, I'm sorry, vitamin E. There is a UL for vitamin E. We also know that megadoses, and we're, we're defining them as doses above the UL, don't provide extra health benefits. So there's no reason to go above 1,000 milligrams per day. Vitamin E is stored in fat tissue, and it can interfere by thinning the blood with vitamin K and anticoagulant medications. So let's talk about this. Let's say your client is prone to many um, strokes and has been sent home from the hospital on Coumadin, which thins the blood. The doctor is very careful about the Coumadin dose because too much thinning can cause bleeding even a subdural hemorrhage, which has the same effect as a stroke. That's why when we discuss vitamin K, vitamin K is important for blood clotting. You don't want to consume too much vitamin K with Coumadin because it will cancel out the effect. Vitamin E, since it thins the blood, increases the effect and that could be a problem. Okay, so remember that supplements could cause bleeding. If you're taking some blood thinning supplements, so maybe some ginkgo and fish oil and vitamin E and a baby aspirin as an over-the-counter, and you get a little cut and it bleeds for a while, that may be due to your supplements. Selenium also has um, an impact in boosting our immune system. It aids glutathione peroxidase, um, which is an antioxidant enzyme and converts dangerous peroxides to water. Okay, so very important and also spares vitamin E. Selenium deficiency is rare in these parts, but is more common in areas where the soil is very low in selenium. And this is um, an photograph of someone with a selenium deficiency from Kishan province. Low levels have been linked to some types of cancer. Symptoms are muscle pain, wasting, and heart damage. Getting enough selenium tends to be easy in North America, but food sources are listed here and here. You can see the difference. When we look at these charts, they um, only show a few sources and they're varied in their levels. And you can see that clearly that frozen peas have very little compared to fresh cremini mushrooms. Too much selenium has not been reported from food sources, but supplementation can cause a high impact. The, or a high level. So can, by the way, too many Brazil nuts, which is very interesting. Um, not that most of us eat more than 10 Brazil nuts in a portion. They tend to be mixed in with other nuts, but that's really something to keep in mind. That can cause the toxicity of selenium, which does have an impact on the GI tract, 
hair loss and cirrhosis as well. One of the things I hope you are hearing as we kind of walk through these slides is you need to be careful with supplements, okay? Food, if we're trying to build a healthy diet, we're generally in a good place with these vitamins and minerals. But regarding supplements, you can get into trouble if you're dabbling without doing the research or without checking with an expert. And I think zinc is our last before the phytochemicals. So you can see the important functions of zinc here. It's a component of superoxide dismutase, which is an antioxidant enzyme. Okay, so it also protects our body. Um, besides being involved with DNA synthesis, protein metabolism, develop, development of bones, et cetera. Zinc deficiency impacts children through delaying sexual development, and in adults can cause a host of different problems, including wound healing, take note of that, and also reduce taste and smell. Okay, very often when we are trying to heal wounds in the hospital setting, we will make sure that patient has extra vitamin C and extra zinc for these reasons. Also note this altered taste and smell. It's very common when people are older that they'll stop enjoying their food and they'll complain about no taste. It's also very common for older people to have low levels of zinc intake. So this is something to look into. So what are the sources? Well, animal protein foods tend to provide most, but zinc is, is found in a wide range of different sources. Toxicity is a possibility from zinc supplements, which are kind of common as immune supplements or cold prevention remedies. And when you take too much of it, this can result in some, some digestive issues for sure. It also tends to give you a metal tasting, um, metal taste in the mouth when you've consumed too much zinc. Here again, you can take a look at food sources. These are from your textbook, so you can refer to them later. And finally, to our antioxidant non-nutrients. So we define nutrients as being essential to growth, maintenance, and repair. And phytochemicals don't fit that bill, but boy, are they important in our diet. And what we're seeing here, here is a number that act as antioxidants. And we also see they tend to come in these brightly colored foods. So blueberries in your yogurt, um, sweet potatoes with your dinner or carrots. All these bright pigments found naturally in food um, are, are likely to be um, part of a phytochemical. What we know about these phytochemicals is they have antibacterial and antiviral properties. Um, plus, and I will say plus for sure. We also say, see they're important for blood pressure and preventing cardiovascular disease and cancer and type two diabetes, really exciting stuff. And that is why when studies look at the plant, a well-designed plant-based diet, we see really good outcomes. Now from your textbook, we see the decision between a dark chocolate brownie and an apple both that contain phytochemicals that act as antioxidants, but we have to consider the rest in that package as well, don't we? So the apple provides vitamins and minerals and fiber, where the brownie, even though it has dark chocolate, probably adds a lot of sugar. When we talk about non-nutrients, we can also talk about our microbiota. So probiotics, prebiotics, et cetera. So let's review this because it was introduced before. Probiotics are live microorganisms that have positive effects on human health. Prebiotics are ingredients of food that aren't digested well, but serve as food or fuel for those beneficial bacteria, okay? So you can read through this. Um, we have looked at this already, but we know 
that there have been a lot of changes in our lifestyle over the past couple of decades that have had an effect on the diversity of the microorganisms that live on and mostly within us. We also know that these beneficial microorganisms tend to live in our large intestine. And you can see, this is a great slide. I actually just noticed this. Um, in the small intestine, we, we begin to see these because the pH of the di digestive juices decreases due to the um, secretions of the pancreas. And we see a count of 1 million CFU per gram. But look at the large intestine. Okay, wow. So these bugs boost the immune system plus, okay, but we're focusing on immune system here. They provide um, a barrier against pathogen invasion, enhance immune system by altering the composition of the microbiota bind to pathogens to secrete or secrete substances to kill them. So healthy gut microbiota is crucial for our immunity, for our defense. I invite you to read that section of this chapter very carefully. Most of the positive Results of research are coming back in the area of diarrhea and allergies. And you can see here, there's been a lot of study of probiotics around diarrhea. And it seems that it does reduce diarrhea significantly in both children and adults. As far as allergies, we also see a, a suggested impact um, by the microbiota to the development of allergies and autoimmune diseases, which is really interesting. So how do you choose a safe and high quality product? Well, as far as the probiotics, foods that actually have those healthy microorganisms, you wanna look for fermented foods, and make sure that you see what you're seeing here, okay? Contains live and active cultures, okay? And fermented foods as well. As far as supplements, um, we have to have the same type of caution we do with all of our supplements, which means do the research. I use consumerlab.com for my research, which is very helpful because it describes what type of microorganisms are important for why you're taking this product. We're only at the beginning of understanding and be, being able to prescribe certain microorganisms. I think in the coming decades, we will actually um, get much better at this. One of the best things you can do and a little less complicated is to increase the fiber content of your diet. So any foods that have fiber, um, especially the foods listed here provide good fuel for those healthy microorganisms. So again, prebiotics provide the fuel, probiotics provide live microorganisms. Okay, one last section, um, very dear to my heart. Uh, this is a disease that's run in my family and that I faced as well. So I'm always following up on the research here. And we're gonna focus on prevention, nutrition and cancer, primarily prevention. But I wanna make a couple of points really, really clear about cancer. Through the decades in the past, we've kind of, shuddered at the thought of cancer, but assumed that it was just, you know, a bad hand of cards or roll of the dice, nothing we could do about it. But what we now know is that only five to 10% of cancers are inherited, 90 to 95% are related to our environment and our lifestyle. Now, what's so exciting about that is that even if cancer runs in your family, you can do something to lower your risk. 
these behaviors, smoking, alcohol intake, physical activity, exposure to UV, and dietary patterns can make a difference, a dramatic difference in your risk. One of the emerging areas, which we know is a major factor, is our excess body fat, excess weight. One in three cancer deaths are linked to excess body fat and suboptimal nutrition along with inadequate physical activity, which to me is exciting because all of the recommendations we make for staying healthy, healthy feeling better, preventing heart disease or diabetes, they are essentially the same. We know that body fat is not just an inert substance. It also stimulates the secretion of hormones, insulin, and estrogen, and these have an impact on different cancers. We also know that excess body fat is pro-inflammatory and increases oxidative stress, which also has an impact as well. Finally, we see in animal studies that cutting calories to under what you would calculate as the need reduces tumor development significantly. Now, how do we apply this? Well, certainly we're consuming in this country far too many calories. So we need to at least get back to, to ground zero there. There are cancer fighting foods. We often look at the foods that are packed with antioxidants and phytochemicals. We consider the intake of vitamin C and vitamin E, fruits and vegetables for sure, and especially these cruciferous vegetables as well. But remember these recommendations that we're looking at, and these were put out from the American Institute for Cancer Research, these recommendations are things that all of us should be doing just to be healthier. Now, notice, and I told you this early on in the course that I was a little disappointed about the dietary guidelines because well, they didn't get stricter about red and processed meats and sugar sweetened drinks. Notice here that there is a cancer correlation also with alcohol consumption. So for far too many years, we focus only on the research around alcohol and cardiovascular disease. And we now know even moderate amounts of alcohol increase the risk of some cancers. Okay, so thank you. Have a great day.